Um, school closures is also um, an important part in the charter school world. Um, it's part of a natural part of the charter school model where schools that um, don't perform well um, for, uh, for several years are designed to close. Um, and we're also seeing it in the district models where uh, some cities are uh, looking at strategic ways to close down uh, low-performing schools to improve the overall education in the city. Um, and finally, we've seen um, some significant political controversy when you have school closures um, in big cities. We saw that in Chicago last year where the mayor took a lot of flack for closing about 40 schools in that district. Um, so we wanted to bring to bear some empirical evidence on what actually happens to students when um, their school closes. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of uh, people um, and groups who helped make this study possible. Um, first, we'd like to acknowledge uh, the funding partners who helped us uh, support this project, the William E. Simon Foundation um, and the Walton Family Foundation, um, along with our sister organization, the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation. Secondly, we'd like to acknowledge uh, a couple external reviewers of this study. Um, Martin West of Harvard University and Andrew McEachin of North Carolina State um, provided some very helpful comments um, on the study design um, and the presentation of the results. Um, and finally, we'd like to acknowledge the Ohio Department of Education um, and the Ohio Education Research, Research Center, um, the OERC, for their help and support um, in providing access to the state records. Um, the study could uh, clearly not have happened um, without their help and support. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our research team um, who conducted and authored the report. Um, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Stefan Lavertu, um, who's a faculty member at uh, Ohio State uh, University's John Glenn College of Public Affairs, now a college, I believe, um, and also Devin, uh, Dr. Devin Carlson at the University of Oklahoma. Now, when we put this team together, we thought, you know, they'd be great on the, their universities would be great on the football field, but we weren't quite sure about how they do in the academic arena. Um, but I think they've proven themselves to be um, fine experts in terms of uh, handling the data and doing a rigorous analysis of school closures. Um, both are accomplished researchers, and uh, we're very proud to have them uh, author this report. Um, so how this, uh, the meeting will work this morning is uh, Dr. Lavertu will present the findings for about 20 minutes, um, and then we'll uh, switch over and do a panel discussion uh, moderated by He'll be participating in the panel in a moment. And uh, by way of overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to provide a little feedback, uh, a little background on school closures. What's the controversy? Why do we need to conduct this study? I'm going to provide some context in, about school closures in Ohio uh, and why this is a particularly good state uh, to study school closures. And after that, I'm going to get into some descriptive statistics. I want to get some understanding of who's affected by school closures. So, the first set of analysis will compare the characteristics of students in closing schools to students in non-closing schools. And these are real human beings, and we want to know who we're affecting. We'll provide some more descriptive statistics on the quality of the schools that are closed, that displace students, and compare that quality to the, to the quality of the schools that displace students switch to. So part of the logic of school closure is that we want these students attending better schools. So that's sort of a necessary condition uh, for the study to make any sense. And finally, I'll get into the meat of the analysis, uh, the impact of school closure on student achievement. I'll spend a little bit of time explaining to you uh, how we were able to estimate uh, this quantity in a convincing fashion, at least uh, as far as the, the, the reviewers are concerned and we're concerned, and then provide some conclusions. 
So school closure increasingly is a strategy for improving achievement. We've had school closure forever, as long as we've had schools, right? Consolidation movements involve closing schools, uh, oftentimes because they're under-enrolled. Um, but lately, we've seen uh, policymakers use school closure as an opportunity to improve student achievement. Student achievement has been a key consideration in what schools uh, are closed. Uh, as Mr. Churchill mentioned, uh, urban districts with declining enrollments uh, have engaged in this sort of closure more often than they used to. Cleveland got a lot of publicity because of its plan to close low-performing schools and to reinforce uh, better-performing schools. And as uh, Mr. Churchill mentioned a moment ago, school choice fundamentally is about getting rid of bad schools and propping up uh, the good ones. If you can hear me, I'm just going to get rid of this. Thank you. And the school turnaround model um, includes, as one of the models for turning around schools, closure, or at least switching uh, to charter schools. And the logic of school closure is fairly straightforward. Displaced students will end up in superior schools because you're getting rid of the worst schools. And so that, what's left are the better schools, and displaced students, therefore, will have access to a better education. And the resources can be reallocated to those schools that are implementing practices that are shown to be working. So the logic seems very sound. But the policy is controversial. Every year in Ohio, we see articles in the newspaper when some district is trying to close down schools. Communities are concerned about it, maybe because of their property values or some other impact that it's going to have on their community to get rid of a school. Maybe uh, that's a place that people congregate. Uh, there are all sorts of, uh, of political concerns. And we hear about them all the time. And sometimes we're not able to, to shut down the lowest performing schools. Other considerations trump achievement. And one of the biggest considerations is concern for displaced students. We have very good reason to believe that school closure could harm the achievement of displaced students. We know that student mobility has a net negative impact on student achievement, that it can take two, three, four years for students to recover from the disturbance that occurs from switching schools. And we know this from studies that look at natural transitions between elementary and middle and high schools, naturally, uh, natural grade transitions that lead to different schools. So we're confronted with this uh, trade-off, right? We have potential academic improvements because you're switching to a better schools or displaced students are switching to a better schools. Uh, but then perhaps the mobility is affecting them as well. And so the question is, what's the net impact? Is there a net positive impact to closing down low-performing schools? And that's an empirical, empirical question. We just need to go find out. And we have very little or negligible evidence about uh, whether or not that's the case. So there's a handful of studies done in a handful of cities, and they show uh, neglig negligible long-term impacts on displaced students or null impacts on, uh, on displaced students. But some of these studies indicate that some of these studies indicate that uh, school closure could be beneficial <coughs> if the schools that are closed are sufficiently low quality. If the, if, the, if the difference in quality between the closed school and a displaced student's new school is so great that it can overwhelm uh, the negative impact of, of, of movement. So we study Ohio school closures, and that makes sense for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is that there are a lot of closures in Ohio. Like other Midwestern states, we've experienced significant population decline, especially uh, in uh, the urban areas. And because we have half-empty schools, we need to close some of these schools. Just uh, economies of scale sort of thing. We've also had tremendous growth in the charter sector. We have something around 400 charter schools now, whereas there weren't uh, any uh, in the 90s, right, in the mid-90s. And increasing the supply means that we've increased competition for traditional district schools. So enrollments might decline further. Uh, but also now we're introducing another type of school closure, charter school closure. These schools are competing with district schools and with one another, and low-performing schools or, or, or other schools that, that, that struggle to, to, to get their uh, student enrollments might shut down. So we have a lot of school closure going on in two different sectors in Ohio. And of course, there's all sorts of other reasons to close down school, but those are, are the reasons I'm emphasizing. So there's other advantages uh, to studying Ohio. 
we have multiple large urban areas. So these other studies we mentioned focus on Chicago or primarily Detroit or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. Um, we have multiple large urban areas and, and so we can have a separate estimated effect for an urban area as opposed to a, a charter sector or rural area. And of course we have a large charter sector which, unlike other states, allows us to estimate the impact of school closure or charter school closure separately. So the focus of this study is the closure of elementary and middle schools from 2006 to 2012. We focus on those closures, uh, elementary and middle, because those are the grades for which we have uh, test scores in consecutive grades in reading and math. And, uh, and I'm referring specifically to uh, Ohio's uh, academic ach or achievement assessments. We examined the impact of closing 120 district schools in the Big Eight districts, Akron, Canton, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, Toledo, and Youngstown, 78 charter schools, and that's, uh, it's impressive that we're able to do that. Uh, and we're focusing on the impact of displaced students. We're not focusing on the impact of anybody else but the displaced students although we have some things to say uh, about the impact on, on the receiving schools. So first, as promised, some descriptive statistics. What are the differences in the student characteristics of students in closing schools and non-closing schools? And in the report, we look at various uh, characteristics. Uh, I'll show you uh, differences in terms of race, economic disadvantage of students, and achievement levels in terms of percentile scores. And I'm comparing schools in their final year of operation to schools that are not in their final year of operation. So the red bars are schools in their final year of operation. Those are the students in schools in their final year of operation. Yellow bars are for schools uh, not in their final year of operation. And the first thing to notice is, of course, we're focusing on big eight districts. And, and so we have high African-American uh, population, economically disadvantaged population, and uh, a population with low achievement. And so I'm just showing you the reading scores, but that, th these are the children that we're dealing with. If you compare closing versus non-closing schools, you'll see that disproportionately, the schools that closed uh, tend to have African-American students, economically disadvantaged students, and low achieving students. So, so low achieving that 80% of students in the state score higher in reading uh, than they do, and that's what the, the percentile score is indicating. So over 90% economically disadvantaged. And here it is for charter schools in our sample. Similar, uh, although um, achievement is slightly higher, uh, and slightly fewer academic, uh, uh, economically disadvantaged students. But the comparisons are, are roughly comparable. So the next set of descriptive statistics I promised you is a comparison of the quality of displaced students' closed schools to the new schools they attended after uh, closure. And we measure quality, uh, once again, with reading and math achievement tests in grades three through eight, and we do it in two different ways. One is achievement levels, like proficiency rate. What's, it, it, we're, we're used to thinking about what percent of this school's students are proficient in math or reading. Uh, and uh, if you have a child and you want them to get into a good school, maybe you want them to have high achieving peers and that's something you care about, but that's cert certainly something we pay attention to. But we also know that this is a problematic measure because proficiency rates or absolute achievement levels include entire <laughs> educational histories that a school might not be responsible for. So something else that we look at is achievement growth, right? The, similar to the value added that uh, Ohio Department of Education calculates the idea is to capture year-to-year -year learning gains of students because you're basically accounting for that educational history and trying to isolate the contribution of schools. And so perhaps that's a better uh, measure of, of school quality depending on your purposes. And again, we're looking at percentiles. We're comparing schools to other schools this time, however. So if you're at the fifth percentile, that means that 95% of schools are doing better than you are, than, uh, than these schools, uh, in terms of reading achievement uh, or growth. And as you see, um, closed schools had lower achievement levels in absolute terms and lower achievement levels in terms of growth. 
right? Lower quality in, ter in terms of academic growth uh, than the new schools that displaced students switched to. In other words, displaced students went to better schools on average, um, and so the logic of school closure could possibly work here. Uh, we, if we find an effect, we have reason to believe that this is one of the mechanisms that's causing uh, a positive effect of school closure. And here it is for charter schools. The difference is even more dramatic. If you look at academic achievement growth as a measure of quality, uh, the closed schools uh, scored about the 12th percentile in terms of academic uh, growth, uh, but the schools to which displaced students switch is around the 35th percentile. That's a dramatic change in improvement in the school's uh, quality that displaced students are experiencing. This figure just tells you which percent of displaced students end up in superior schools according to the absolute achievement level, the red bars, and growth, the yellow bars. And as you can see, in big eight schools, we have 60% uh, of displaced students almost uh, end up in better schools, and it's almost 70%. Uh, in charter schools, whatever metric you, you decide to use. So we have reasons to believe uh, that charter school closure in these urban areas and, and charter schools could have been helpful in Ohio during this time period. So let's get to the meat of the analysis. What is the impact of school closure uh, on the achievement of displaced students? So what we're going to do is a comparison. We're going to compare students who attended schools that would ultimately close or that would ultimately, students that would ultimately experience school closure to students that didn't experience that school closure. And we're going to compare them in the two different sectors separately. So we have comparisons among students in that would experience closure and that would not experience closure in big eight district schools and a similar comparison within the charter sector so that we're comparing apples to apples. Importantly, we want to account for the educational histories of these students for the very same reasons I mentioned a moment ago. We want to make sure uh, that when we're making comparisons, it is apples to apples. And so what we're really doing is comparing how students were doing before a closure event to how they, were, they did after the closure event. And we make that very same comparison for the students that didn't experience closure. How did they do prior to the closure event how did they do after the closure event? And so we, have, we observe these students in parallel and we can compare their gains one year after closure, two years after closure, three years after closure, in comparison to how they were doing two years before, one year before, or the year of. And if you read the report, we really went to town making these comparisons in every way possible to make sure that these results are real. Finally, the way I'm going to report the results is in days of learning. Credo's popularized uh, this method. In the report, we tend to emphasize uh, standard deviations, which mean very little to anybody uh, intuitively. Uh, days of learning assumes that there's 180 days of learning in a given school year, 180 days of school. And we try to capture the effects in terms of the proportion uh, of school time that a student might have needed to catch up to another student, essentially. So in days of learning, what kind of advantage did one student population, the, close, uh, the displaced students have over the non-displaced students, those who experienced closure and those who didn't experience closure? We can express the difference in their achievement in terms of how many days it would have taken for them to learn that much content um, in a school year. So I'm going to show you a figure that presents uh, those differences over time, one year after closure, the closure event, two years after the closure event, three years after the closure event. And what you're going to be seeing is a comparison in the achievement in terms of days of learning of students who experienced closure compared to those who didn't. If the bar is above the zero, the x axis, it indicates that there's a positive advantage to closure. If it's below, it indicates a negative impact of closure, because that's how we calculated the difference. Closed school students minus non-closed school students, or non-displaced students. So here it is for the big eight districts. Remember, we did the calculation separately for the two sectors. In the big eight districts, those 120 closures affected thousands of students, and comparisons reveal that after the first year in reading, it was as if students whose schools were closed 
had 25 more days of learning than comparable students whose schools didn't close. In statistical sense, what we're saying is the impact of school closure by the first year was an extra 25 days of learning. That's the equivalent improvement in achievement that these students experienced. In math, it was a little more attenuated around uh, 12 more days of learning after the first year. And you see that this increases over time. So by the third year, those students who experienced closure had almost 50 more days of learning. Their achievement was as if they had 50 more days of learning. Um, and we interpret that as the impact on that student of, of closure. Here it is for charter schools. With charter schools, a little bit different in the sense that the gains are almost all immediate and the, the increase over time is not nearly as great. Um, but the achievement effects by the third year are comparable. The one difference is the reading effect uh, disappears. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is, uh, uh, but, but that's uh, the case here. It's worth noting that more years down the line, we have fewer observations to work with. So let me summarize the results because I didn't show you everything that's in the report. Uh, first, what I did show you, um, school closure uh, displaced relatively poor minority and low achieving students. We focus on, on urban districts, but the, the, the students that experienced closure um, were even uh, more uh, poor and low achieving uh, than those students. Displaced students typically ended up in better schools, although a large fraction didn't, right? You can flip it around, uh, but the majority did. And they had larger achievement gains. What I didn't show you, and what we find in the report, which is evidence that the mechanism of school closure is underlying some of these results, is that when we limit the analysis to students that switch to better schools, the achievement gains were even greater, much greater. Uh, than the days of learning I just showed you. And the achievement effects for charter schools in reading do not go away in the third year. So when these students are switching to superior schools, we have very large sustained effects. So to some extent, what I showed you was relatively conservative in terms of the estimate. Concluding thoughts. If you're concerned about student achievement in reading and math as measured by Ohio's achievement assessments, um, clearly closing low performing schools seems to have a positive impact in these urban, primarily urban environments uh, where charter schools operate. We have reason to believe that this would work mostly in densely populated areas and we, the most credible analysis we could conduct was in these areas. We also did some analysis on the rest of the state, not as credible because we don't have apples to apples comparisons, but the, the findings were sort of negligible. Uh, we had some positive, some negative, and they sort of washed out. Uh, so we can't say much about school closure outside of densely pop populated areas, but that's our focus here. D and it makes sense. Densely populated areas have more options. Some caveats. Um, there's disruption to absorbing schools, schools that take in teachers, staff, and students from those closed schools. Um, you can imagine that the more students they take in, the more disruption there is, and there might be some tipping point. We, it, we uh, observe a little bit of that. But um, some studies in indicate that that's short term, so we can't conclusively say anything about that. And of course, schools need to be sufficiently low quality. If you're trying to close low performing schools, but all of your schools are roughly comparable, uh, then you might not get that big jump, and you might not get uh, that uh, improvement in achievement that compensates for mobility. Thank you. All right, so thank you all for coming today. Um, we're really excited about this study. We've, it's been in, in the works for a long time, and we think it really has some, some implications that'll be different for everyone. So what we brought today was a panel that I'd like to think is a pretty expert and all-star panel of folks who will bring some very different perspectives on the issue. Um, so let me quickly introduce them and then Yeah, it's clearly not working very well. That's okay, I'll jiggle it. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, some Q&A for probably 20 or 25 minutes from me, and then we'll open it up to you. And if you guys don't have questions, then you'll have to endure a few minutes at the end. So uh, our faculty, uh, excuse me, our panel members um, are Stephanie Gross, former school board member uh, from 2006 to 2011. Okay, I was too optimistic. Of the Columbus City School. 
uh, Pete Van Leer, who is the Director of School Quality, Policy, and Communications for the Cleveland Transformation Alliance. And Dr. Devin Carlson, one of the co-researchers on this study, a professor at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, uh, the Honorable Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, before becoming mayor in 2013, she served two terms on the Dayton City Commission. And Tracy Kraft, the Deputy Director of Advocacy for the Black Alliance for Educational Options. All right, now they've got long resumes. You can find them all online. I'm gonna just jump right into questions. Um, first question, let's start with Devin. Um, were you surprised with the findings, particularly given what you know about mobility, school closure research, and the like? So, um, I, I, don't know that, I, I don't know that I'd say I was surprised. I was really curious about what we were going to find. Um, the mobility, the negative effect of mobility is one of the most well-established findings in the education policy literature. Um, but on the other hand, the effects of school quality are really well established. Uh, Eric Hanischek and other, and other scholars have shown that attending a very high quality school can lead to much better outcomes than attending a lower quality school. And so once we saw that the improvement was in school quality was so substantial for our students, uh, for the students we studied, I wasn't that surprised that the effects of closure were positive. Um, in, in a sense, it was reassuring. It would have been a little disconcerting to see such a big increase in school quality but no attending or no um, no no um, increase in in student outcomes as well. So um, it, in a sense, it was reassuring and it, it satisfied my curiosity going into the study. Great, thank you. All right, I'll jump in with another question. This one for Tracy. Um, one of the findings I think people some people will find surprising, many people will find disturbing, is that the students affected mostly uh, or, or disproportionately are often low income minority, um, low achieving students. And as an organization that advocates specifically for, especially uh, African American students, what are, you, what are your thoughts? I, I, you know, it's, it's such a tif difficult balancing act. You're saying, wow, a certain group of students are more affected, but wow, student achievement improves. So sort of what is your reaction to the, the research? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I was surprised. I, I would say that um, from a parent perspective and an organization that we really do uh, try to connect with the communities that we serve and specifically low income and working class black families, what we found is that when parents know better, they do better. And so when you're closing or making the decision to close low performing schools, um, it's important for us because one thing that I, I found interesting is, and, and we maybe didn't do any research on this, but I was thinking about it as I was reading through the report, um, what the impact on parents is. Because when we're finding that our school, a school that maybe generationally we've been sending our families to, our children, this is an established uh, building in the community and we connect with it, um, sometimes we are disheartened that the school is now closing, but what Bayo does as an organization working with parents that are in schools that are now closing is we make sure that we bring them to the conversation. So when we're explaining to them how we got to this place, why we're here, it didn't happen overnight, here are some things that you can do now that the school is closing, here are other options, and educating them about what the options are seems to lend itself to the children doing better in the next school that they're in. And so I wasn't surprised, but I also realized that when you're talking about urban communities that are dealing with the challenges that they face, which in many instances are very different than those of many of us in this room today. So we don't understand that parents are really focused on other issues, but when you bring them to the table, arm them with information, and equip them to make the de decisions that are best for their children. At the end of the day, they end up doing so, and the children are better off for it. That's great, and uh, as great as that answer was, this wasn't prep. They had no idea what the question was gonna be. That's great, Tracy, thank you. And it provides a great segue to my next question, which, which is prep, so I don't have to think on the fly, and that is to Mayor Whaley. Um, you know, what Tracy's talking about is the level of engagement it ne it's needed in a community. As a leader of a community who's tackling the quality of education and has spent a lot of time and energy on that issue, sort of uh, 
not just your reaction, but sort of what have, what are you seeing in Dayton? Uh, you know, will there is there or has there been a, a push for closures? Sort of how do you think something like this affects and impacts your community? <laughs> Well, I think that the study shows the validation, I think what we all thought that, you know, uh, if you close low performing schools, students will do better in better schools, which I think is the key point uh, that we all believe to be true and is now validated. Uh, when you're talking about something we're in, in the city of Dayton where we have 70 schools, both charter, public, and, uh, and uh, private for 20,000 students, uh, there's definitely an appetite, I think, for the community to close some of those low-performing schools. Uh, making sure that we're able to do that, I think, is key. I think this helps validate that and show that there's an opportunity that you know students can learn more if they're in a in a better performing school. But I think, in general, too, across urban districts, we have to make sure that we do have high-quality schools as well. That just you know, if all of the schools or the vast majority of the schools are low-quality, I think we have a bigger issue at play in the urban districts in the urban area. Great. So for every mayor that's actively involved, well, there's a very small number of mayors, like Mayor Whaley, that actually get involved in this, because it's hard. Um, but almost every school board is actively involved in this or has to confront these types of questions. So my next question is for Stephanie. Um, in a school district, uh, being on a uh, former board member of Columbus City Schools, which has certainly had to face these, these types of issues and declining enrollment, sort of what is your reaction to this? What is it like sitting, being the political decision-making body that's in charge of making these decisions at a community level? My initial reaction to the study is that it's not surprising at all. Schools are generally closing, as you point out, because of declining enrollment. Enrollment, enrollment is declining because people aren't choosing that building. And typically, they're not choosing a building based on quality. So that's not surprising. From a policy standpoint, I mean, I think it, during my tenure on the board, I probably was involved in the closing or consolidating of 20, 21 buildings. And it is an enormously difficult task because unlike almost any other decision you make in a school, you can change a principal, half the people are happy, half the people are unhappy. You can take out a program, the same, same result. But when you close a school building, it affects everybody equally. So it's a rallying cry for the community. And if there's no plan for that building, when the building is closed, that's even worse. So engaging the community and what's going to happen afterwards is really important. But you know, this is a study that should you know, be in the hands of every weak need school board member because this is something that they need to read and embrace because getting more kids into quality schools is what we absolutely need to do. All right, thank you. And my next question, you can probably see how I'm working this. The next question is for Pete. <laughs> um, so you work for an organization that's been created as part of the Cleveland Plan, which is probably the most ambitious effort, certainly in the state of Ohio, to improve an entire city's public schools. So this is an issue that you have to look at, especially with the declining enrollment the city's had over the years. Uh, and it, a closure is certainly an issue you have to deal with and thinking about in terms of its impact on families and the providing high quality information, which the Transformation Alliance is committed to doing. So how is your organization thinking about this and how does an issue like this impact in Cleveland? Well, it's certainly, I mean, as you know, there a lot of schools have closed in Cleveland and it's really a core piece of what we see as our role, um, you know, our two, two of our primary goals are increasing the number of quality seats uh, for students in Cleveland. So that's opening new schools and repurposing lower performing schools, but also eliminating failing schools is a big piece of it. So we see our role as really important in this because I think it's sort of touched on in this report, you know, so we see the evidence that kids are going to higher performing schools and doing better well. We see our role, we're going next week, for instance, to a closing charter school, holding a school fair for the families and bringing in some different charter and district partners to say, here are some of the options, the higher quality options in, in your area, in your neighborhood that you could attend. So rather than leaving it to just by the management company or, or the knowledge of the parents, we're really trying to provide them through our information on the schools, you know, where, where might you be able to go? How can, you, how can we help you navigate the system? And I think that kind of role, the role we play of an independent, objective, you know, essentially agnostic organization, we don't care who the operator is, quality is what really matters, trying to come in and help in that situation I think is really important. 
So we see you know, that's a, a huge role for us to, to be able to help those families on that basis. And the more we can do of that, I think it's better you know, to have that kind of focus on when a school closes rather than just leave it to the interested parties, but to have somebody come in and really try to help those families you know, achieve these. I think it, there's also the question to me of like higher performing versus high performing, right? I mean, so we're really looking, trying to raise up to the highest performing schools and if we can find those students in the low performing schools, the closing schools, a home, a new place, and the highest performing schools in the city, that's only going to help them, it's going to help the city as a whole. So that's really, this is a really interesting report and it fuels our need to like really reach, reach the families who are affected by closure. That's great. Thank you. Tracy, you look like you're ready to say something. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about, about it from that angle. And while I, I personally feel that, you know, school closures are really just a part of the work that we do, because at the end of the day, uh, I see it as another opportunity to hold schools accountable for what they open their, their doors to do. And so if at the end of the day, they're not meeting the needs of the children that are housed there, then we have what I see as a moral responsibility to close that option and offer other options to families. But then when we talk about going into the community, it really is about bringing the community into the conversation because while the experts are making those decisions, there's still a, the results of those decisions are impacting our children and particularly low income and working class black families. And so what I liken this to the work that I'm doing now in Memphis around school closings and kind of the whole matching process. And what we found is that communities feel like this is something that's been done to them without their buy-in, without their say. And so the more that we approach school closures with the understanding that yes, we have to make these difficult decisions, but we can't do it alone. And again, I go back to bringing the, commu the community, the parents, the business leaders all into the conversation because their voices do matter. And at the end of the day, they're gonna be the ones that are impacted by this change. So we've gotta make sure that when we're making these decisions, that they're a part of the process and that we really do listen to uh, their voices as the decisions are being made. That's great. Um, Mayor Whaley, I think you touched on this a little bit in, your, in the answer to the first question. Um, but, you know, the, the stat you gave was pretty startling. You know, you've got 70 schools, 70 plus schools with 20,000 students. So, you know, as we do the math, uh, some probably faster than others. Um, it, you've got a lot of schools that are likely under capacity, uh, most likely in your community. So, you know, as you're thinking about this, and w I think what, we've, what the study shows in parts of it is it makes recommendations and it says, look, this is, this is really difficult to do. And it's really difficult to do politically. How do you even begin to tackle an issue like this? Because a as Tracy said, people feel it's done to them rather than being done with them or for them. Um, so, so how are you thinking about that type of issue? Well, when I was elected mayor last year, uh, we started a, um, a city citywide effort called City of Learners, and uh, we had around 12 listening sessions across the city and broke into five different areas. One area was high quality schools, and on that co on that committee, and we heard from across the city uh, some of the priorities that the the community wanted to, to Tracy's point to make sure that we had you know frankly, community buy-in to what, what they defined as what did they want their education system to look like. Uh, so the High Qualities Committee has a charter and public and private and the business community together really tackling what is quality in Dayton. And uh, I think once we establish, and they're in the process of that, and that's, you know, a tough conversation to have, and there's a lot of back and forth, but that will be established this year. And then once that, once that is established, it is everyone has agreed this is what quality is in Dayton. And having both charter and public uh, in, in the, you know, the this, this system, uh, the school system in at the table about it, I think is very key uh, because we need everyone to agree this is the value we're going to set and this is what it means. And we'll do these, these certain actions as a community for the schools that want to buy into turning around and then we will you know, have conversations with those that won't. But I think that Tracy's point is so important in that because it can't be just like 
uh, some secret group that quickly does this. It has to be open, it has to be transparent, and, uh, and I think it will be very difficult. But when you have the number of schools that are under capacity that aren't performing, you have to do something, I think, and that's, I think that's the key for Dayton in this future. That's great. Uh, Stephanie, back to you. Um, so Columbus is, and we, we again mentioned this a little bit in your, in your first remarks, Columbus is a little bit further down the path um, in that they've made some closures over the years. Um, are they where they need to be? I mean, specific, uh, you're obviously, you, you live in Columbus, you have experience. Uh, is there more work to be done in this city to try to, to uh, drive students to higher performing schools and to and potentially utilize closure? Yes, absolutely. I mean, She's trying to save us time. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're right, though. I mean, I think that Columbus should get some credit for closing buildings. I think since 2002, more than 40 buildings have been closed or consolidated. Um, they're, uh, they've put in place board policy that requires them to look at enrollment and other factors at least every three years, but even more often. So all of those things are great, but we still have buildings that are, in some buildings, unfortunately, that are brand spanking new, that are at 40% capacity and very persistently low performing. And, we can't afford that. I mean, that rob, I mean, half empty buildings rob every other student in the district, in addition to being low performing for the children who are in them. So we've got to, I think, have a really difficult conversation about the buildings that we have, what we've done, and you know, are we hanging on to buildings out of legacy? I think somebody mentioned that earlier, which is a tough thing to do. You know, and, and when we, they went through a tough, closing last year I wasn't on the board and there were high schools put on the list for the first time in a long time. So there's a high school that's on the list, they took it off the list as a result of community meetings. A lot of the kids from that high school would have been displaced to a lower performing building. Well, that's, we can't do that. If we're still having, if we're still making those kinds of recommendations, we have not done enough yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is for Pete. Um, you know, I, I think that, and uh, when we released this study, everybody thought uh, the very first few questions we got, especially from the media, was like, this is about charter schools, right? And I think you can see from the data that it's not just charter schools, that when charter schools close, there's a bump in student achievement if they're lower performing, but it happens just as much with district schools, which doesn't get focused on nearly as much. So Pete, with the, again, with the city of Cleveland, um, how are you thinking about that? Because I know that charter schools tend to get the headlines, um, but I also know the district's been very active with their sort of portfolio management and trying to create, as I think you mentioned, high, high, really high performing schools, not just higher performing schools. So how, how are you guys thinking about it from the district perspective as well as you look to sort of improve the city schools? Well, the district is very actively looking at either, I mean, they're closing two K-8 schools this year, low-performing K-8 schools, um, and they are also, at the high school level, they're doing more of the phase-in, phase-out, where they're phasing in some new models into existing schools, you know, totally new schools, essentially, then phasing out the old schools grade by grade. So it's certainly um, a big part of what the district is, is doing there. Um, and they, you know, they have a sponsorship piece too to what they do and they're strengthening that and looking at, I mean they have very, they've chosen very strong charter partners for that piece of it so that that's another real, you know, it's sort of both pieces go together, creating new schools, higher performing schools and then closing the schools that are underperforming or the lowest performing schools. Um, they do still, you know, there's a question of like how many schools can or should you close at once and somebody else mentioned capacity to take them in and is, are there enough higher performing schools to, to find better, better schools for everybody? Um, and that's a good question. There, there, there's a lot of work around investing in some of the lower performing schools and looking at the mid-performing schools even, how do you bring them up? And I think that's, that's challenging work, but I think it's, it's hard to talk about just the one piece separately by itself, but it's, it's all connected and the district is taking a very active look at how do they address their lowest performing schools. Great. Thank you. All right, one more question, and then I'll open it up to you guys. And again, you've been warned, I have other ones ready. So uh, I'll go back to Dr. Carlson on this one. Um, you know, one of the things is we're looking at um, school closures, and I think it was mentioned once today, um, school closing is hard. So a lot of times people opt for the school turnaround type measure. 
So would you like to talk about sort of what you've seen from the data uh, to the extent you're versed in it, of course, um, in terms of how well that works? Because my understanding is it's, it's challenging to turn around the school. Yeah, so um, the, the school turnaround has been a big focus of the Obama administration's uh, education department. They, with the school improvement grants and, and through Race to the Top, they put a big emphasis on um, a few different turnaround models. And the, the effects of those are being studied right now as we speak. They've released a couple of um, interim reports that don't show much of an effect, um, actually show no effect. Um, of, of the school turnaround efforts on, on student achievement. Um, the, final, the final evaluation of that large scale initiative um, that came out of US Ed, I believe is due sometime in the next year, um, but it's, it's not been very clear about exactly when that will come out. But to date, the evidence on school turnarounds is, is not that strong, um, is, is my reading on it. It's a very difficult thing to do, it's a challenging thing to do, um, and the, there's not a whole lot of evidential base around it, but the evidence that does exist is that it, it doesn't have much in effect, those types of efforts. Well, if everyone's all pumped up now, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, we'll go ahead and go with questions. Um, so you have a choice, you can either go to the microphone or you can have me try to repeat your questions so we can make sure we get it on tape. So it's uh, your choice, of any, any questions? All right, so if, if the research is stronger when a student goes to a better school, how are you operationalizing what a better school means? Uh, the re researcher comment and then to the panel. Devin, can, yeah. Um, so we, we operationalized better school in two ways. The first was the percentage of students who are a proficient or above at the school, the average achievement level in the school. Um, and the second way was the school's contribution to student achievement gains over the course of the year. And it turned out that the way we measured it didn't really, it didn't really matter very much. The results were very similar across those two different measures of school quality. And uh, whether, the board, or whether the rest of the panel thinks those are good measures, or I'll let them. Was that the second part of the question? That's the second part. Does the, the way they're thinking about something being a better school, does that make sense to you with your, all of your experiences? I mean, I think perfectly, I think it does. I think the big conversation here is just in the urban districts and the urban areas, making sure we have enough high quality seats, right? So it's, you like there's only one part of this equation really being talked about when you're talking about school closures, which is the hard part and the most difficult to the community. But if you don't have high quality seats, it's nearly impossible to make this move. And I think that's a much harder challenge in some ways to, to the cities. Responses. And I'd just like to add, um, I think those are great ways to measure um, a school's performance, but I go back again to making sure that the communication with the families that are now placed in a situation where they have to decide where next to send their child is our work on the ground is really about uh, while we say that uh, this school is academically performing higher than the school that your child was currently in, that may, that's important. However, for parents, there are a lot of different um, or a myriad of reasons why they choose or have to choose a different school. So helping them to understand what their child's needs are in this process and helping them to, to choose a school that's gonna best meet those needs is gonna be just as equally important to their success in the new uh, educational environment than it was in the previous. And I would just add to that, um, we have a program we call our School Quality Ambassador Program, where we're training, recruiting and training volunteers and paying, able to pay them a small stipend to be sort of on the ground, along with our staff and, and other partners in the community, to be on the ground talking precisely about those issues. What is the best fit? What, um, what are you looking for? Because quality is, we think about quality in a certain way, we think about it academics. Not everybody 
thinks that way. There's a lot of things that people are looking for, whether it's students or families. We've done some um, focus groups on this issue, and it's, it's really a complex picture when you start talking to folks in the community. And then, you know, there's the other thing that I think we need to talk about and that we run into all the time. So many people make a decision based on location. Is it close enough? Is it right. where I work? Or, and that in, is really, and for many people, is the main factor. Can I get to the, my child to that school on time every day, pick them up when I need to? And so I think that's a real struggle for both charter schools and district schools. Like, how do you provide quality not only in, you know, citywide draw seats, for instance, Cleveland, there's a big, there, there's a certain set of schools that are providing citywide choice, and with the district itself, there's transportation. Many of the charters um, also provide some form of transportation, but also that neighborhood focus and really providing those quality options at the neighborhood level. And that's, you know, just a lot of moving parts, but that is hugely important because if a family <coughs> can't get across town to the school that might be their best fit, you've got to have something where they can go. So. I just want to piggyback. There's it's a little different, I think, in Dayton, too. We actually see a lot of um, uh, parents will move their children across town, a large number moving across town, but the decision is more on the transportation issue. If my cousin or my aunt can help with the transportation. So you're seeing big blocks of families in these conversations moving one way or the other. Uh, and I think that's been really fascinating because it did come from like a more neighborhood focus, being an, a city side elected official, you know, the neighborhood and how it connects to the schools has always, I think, been an advantage. But I've just been really taken aback on how far people will travel if they perceive, even perceive it to be of quality with the connection of their, their extended family. I think that's a fascinating part of this conversation. Absolutely. Uh, so I think I saw David's hand first, and I'll work around the room. Sure. So, Chad, permission to do a comment and then a question? Is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, so we saw 21 charter schools close down over the summer. This is not the ones that you read about that were sponsored by St. Al's in North Central Ohio last October, or 2013 October, which should never have started anyways. It's another 21 charter schools that were closed down by the normal authorizing the charter board process. We've tracked those students in terms of what schools they went to, so we haven't done the actual longitudinal study yet. They're just finishing up their first year. But we saw out of those 21, it's about 3,000 students, about 2,000 were in graded schools. Uh, we looked at it a little bit differently, but we were interested in comparing and contrasting what we did and found. Uh, we found that the average, uh, the average of the schools they went to compared to the schools they left was a full uh, proficiency grade higher and a half a grade higher on value add. And then another thing we did, this relates to what Pete's talking about, we looked at one of those schools in particular and put together a kind of a pilot project where we went down and we were the catalyst. ODE uh, doesn't necessarily have the ability to put together school fairs, but we took you know, the kind of approach that I think Tracy would recommend. We worked with the community and parents as best as we could. This was the school called BLT down in Cincinnati, a very difficult situation. We reported at the same time. And we found that, the, that those kids have moved in a very bad school to begin with, moved in even better than what our overall results, moved to schools that were even better than what our overall results showed. So there's a lot to be learned and, and to be gained by taking a proactive transformational alliance approach to this, <clears throat> to try to help families to get the information. Uh, so often I think that families come to school choice in moments of duress. The school they are used to is now closed, a moment of duress. And all of a sudden, they're looking around and just imagine if you have to buy a car when your car is broken down, how uncomfortable that is compared to when you're buying a car because you've had it for five years and are ready to move on. Then the second thing is that really, you know, um, there may have been data issues because I know this program is growing, but the voucher program is a very important component of quality school choice. Stephanie, there's uh, uh, co valedictorians at St. Francis de Sales this year. Both of them are, are scholarship students. One of them, a wonderful young lady who's on a full ride to uh, Notre Dame, her uh, middle school was closed, public middle school was closed, that's what got her into the program. Her high school, if she had stayed in the program, the city program, would have been, I think, is it Brookhaven or Brookwood, that Brookhaven. would have been closed this year. So right. she would have been closed out of two schools. Right. You know, you, you should be happy for her, yes. in the sense that she's got a successful track. It's too bad that that happened, hap happened to happen to her in the neighborhood she lived in. 7,300 students next year probably on the scholarship in Cleveland. It's the proficiency grade gains in Cleveland on the scholarship program are stunning. They're not consistent across the whole state, but it's a very important part of the picture. And I just, you know, may, again, I know there may be data reasons, but I certainly can say that for those who are policymakers and leaders in their communities, 
There's a lot of excess capacity at those schools as well. Uh, Cardinal Moody of Youngstown has 300 open seats in that city. I haven't looked at the data, num uh, the date numbers, but I'm sure there's significant capacity at those schools as well, at least in terms of physical space. There's always the challenges of teachers and you know and other kinds of things that go along with running a private school. But that's just a, just a thought, perhaps there's some reaction. Yeah, I'd actually like to react to that. I mean, I'm a little bit jealous, you know, hearing about Cleveland and hearing about Dayton. What we do lack in Columbus is a partnership where we don't try, I mean, I'm biased. In the interest of full disclosure, I sit on the School Choice Ohio board, so I'm very pro school choice advocate. Just get kids into good schools. I don't care what you call them, just put kids in good schools. So we don't partner in Columbus, we rarely partner in Columbus with charter schools and with private schools that are offering vouchers. And I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why we don't. What, what is stopping us from putting a child into sales who's gonna become a valedictorian rather than a school that's gonna close in three years? Why do we think that that's a good idea? So I'd love to hear you know, about your partnerships because for some reason here in Columbus, we just can't get to that yet. And it's unfortunate, it's just, it's just unfortunate. I just make a comment on the uh, uh, parochial schools, I call them, I don't know what they're supposed to be called now, but uh, uh, the, the uh, Archdiocese of Cincinnati, I think, has done a great effort in really changing their mission and focus around, around these issues, specifically in Dayton. Uh, and I, th I think we're seeing them, they're pretty full, is my understanding, anecdotally, not research-based, uh, anecdotally uh, in, our, in our community, uh, with new sets of challenges and actually some real tough dis discussions with some of their teachers in those schools because it's a change in mission and a change in focus for uh, the Catholic schools. Uh, we've had a great, great uh, partnership with them, uh, with the City of Learners Initiative. I think the first listening session was actually at one of their, one of their sites. Uh, but, and we've also seen that be a great advantage for, for the city uh, and some of our neighborhoods to be able to have that choice uh, for those students in those neighborhoods that have frankly saved some of our neighborhoods and so we recognize that as well. Uh, so, I mean, it's not all uh, easy peasy, right? I right. mean, you know, public schools, charters, and uh, uh, private schools all sitting together. I think there's tough discussions and sometimes uh, you really have to push the conversation because it's easier to go around the conversation than go through it and so we're still learning that. And uh, I, think, I think all of the urban schools have to continue, the urban areas have to continue that, that discussion if we're really serious about making sure that our kids are going to be able to have great jobs. I mean, that's really what, what we're trying to focus on. So I'd like to add, David, thank you for, for bringing that point up because as a parent who had the opportunity to send my children when they were much younger to a parochial school uh, on a scholarship that was offered in the, in the city of Dayton, I know firsthand the impact that placing your child in a school that meets their needs, how it can impact and change the traje traje trajectory <laughs> of their lives. And so now uh, my daughters at 8 and 11 were exposed to this opportunity. And as a result of that, I've got one that's graduating this summer with her bachelor's in finance and the other who's at the University of Dayton starting this fall, her third year, in pre-dentistry. So I know that access to options makes a difference. I lived it, I breathe it every day. And though my children now are in post-secondary education, I'm just as committed to making sure that I continue to be a voice on behalf of those children, children who do not have advocates in their parents for whatever reason. And so when we are working with communities, when we're talking to parents, when we're connecting with the business community, we're proposing, and that's the beautiful thing about being a part of an organization that supports all of the options. We don't have to limit ourselves to just charter school conversations or scholarship or voucher opportunities. We can bring the whole host of options to the conversation and really work directly with families to make sure that they're connecting with a school that's going to best meet their child's needs. Excellent point. Right. All right, I think I saw that. Your hand, sir. I've got a ton of questions, but I'll hold it for this one. Uh, the researchers did most of your analysis at the individual or the student level, but you've also got 198 schools that closed down, and some of your analysis, I think, is that the units of analysis are there and, and anytime you come out with a broad picture like this there are 
differences in quality. Are there, can you describe the schools that most should have shut down? And are there some of the schools or some cluster of the schools that probably shouldn't have shut down? So we, we didn't make any normative judgments like that. We looked just at which schools did shut down. Um, and we reported average statistics because we had to choose something to report. Um, we could have reported schools at the 10th percentile, 25th percentile. We, we could have done a different, bunch of different ways. Um, and there was a distribution on, on many of these characteristics in terms of percent, percent African American, percent economic disadvantage. Um, but I think the average provides an accurate portrayal of what was going on. The, the average school that closed was disproportionately African American, disproportionately economically disadvantaged, and disproportionately low achieving. Now there are some schools that were obviously above the average, some that were you know, far below, but I think that average um, portrayal provides an accurate depiction of, of the schools that were closed. Uh. There was, um, and I think it's reported, I'm pretty sure it's reported in a sidebar in the report. Um, the, the long and short of it is that um, of the students who were in a closing district school, about 95% went to another district school, about 5% went to a charter school. Of the students in a closing charter school, about half went to another charter school, half went back to a district school. Um, it didn't make much difference whether a student moved to a charter school or to a district school um, and how they did afterwards. Go ahead. For the panel, how much, and this may be more for the, for the political kind of questions, uh, how much of this is about um, bad teachers and how much of it is about uh, kind of closing failing schools uh, in the sense that from a policy standpoint, one is, might be easier to accomplish than other, one might be easier to discuss than I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I remember, I think maybe it was 2008 or 2009, and I was over at a school in the Linden area. It was a school closing meeting. And milling about afterward, a teacher comes up to me and says to me, gosh, this is the third building I've been in that's closing. <laughs> and I thought, right, I, you know how I react? I mean, the wheels are just spinning. Like, no, that's not the building's fault. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, I mean, they're almost synonymous, right? I mean, so schools are in a easier to accomplish than other. I mean, yes, exactly. Right. Why we're talking about school closure rather than, than, than teachers? Um, yes, it's. I think it's easier to close a school building than it is to have the difficult conversation about how we improve teacher quality. I, I think you have to do both. I mean, I think that yes. that's really the. Effort. I mean, the, there's <clears throat> this is a, you know, high quality schools and making sure our kids are ready for. Uh, what we need in the workforce in 10 to 15 years is a complex issue. And so I think what we learn, the more we have studies, the more we look into communities, is there has to be a, 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 an approach that is not a silver bullet and not one answer. So yes, teacher quality is very important. And what we do on teacher quality, and, and, and in Dayton's case, attracting high quality teachers when there are openings is very important. And yes, the culture of a school building or uh, the, um, the situation with an ineffective charter school is important too. So I think that I, I, there's, the more I, you know, and I'm a novice compared to this room, but the more I'm into this, the, the more it is very complex and needs to have a variety of answers and solutions to make sure that we get high quality on the end and that our kids are ready to go. And from our perspective, we're happy to push the discussion on all of those issues. Uh, last month, shameless plug number one, we had our speaker series event on teacher evaluations, which was a great conversation. Students First and the Ohio Federation of Teachers were both up here talking about some of those very difficult issues. And in a future month, maybe next month, maybe the month after, we're planning one on school leadership because you didn't mention school leadership, right. but a, a teacher can be great, but with ineffective building leadership, uh, a lot of things cannot work at the school level. So, uh, so yes and, for certainly from our perspective. Charlie? Yeah, uh, 
Two points. Uh, first, our questions. I mean, uh, the uh, is there anything in the data, or do any of the panelists have a reaction? We're focusing today on closure, and that's the charter school closure. Or school closure, uh, and uh, the general assembly is focusing in their charter reform mostly on closing uh, low-performing charter schools. My question is. As David said, is there, can we focus more on making sure <coughs> low performing schools never ever get open in the first place, never get the opportunity to serve six or seven or eight or nine years worth of, of students who are badly served by uh, low performing schools where we know in advance, or can we know in advance, I think we can know in advance, what schools are likely to not be very successful at all. That's my first one. My second one is as a school board member in a suburban school district, while I live in Columbus, I'm a suburban school district uh, school board member. Uh, when we, we've closed a primary, an elementary school and a middle school, in both situations, they were our high, it was our highest performing middle school, it was our highest performing elementary school. Should suburban school districts be taking into account the quality of the school or just the enrollment? We selected the, actually I advocated, maybe closing the lowest performing middle school and the lowest performing uh, elementary school that did not go over well. Instead, we closed the uh, one that was losing the most uh, children, uh, the elementary school and the middle school. So, I, is there anything in the study that suggests suburban schools that are rated uh, A plus uh, or excellent distinction uh, should they be considering the quality of the school that closing, selecting schools to close when they're declining So, um, to your to, to that, I'll start with your second question. And um, if, if those students can go to a better school, then maybe. Um, but that seems unlikely if you're closing the, among the highest performing schools. Um, I mean, one of the key takeaways from our study, I think, is that the, uh, the effects of closure are, are most positive when students move to a higher quality school. And so that, I think, is the key mechanism underlying everything that was going on in our study. All of our positive results is that, on average, kids went to better schools. and so. That would suggest that uh, from a policy standpoint, quality should probably be the primary consideration. It's, ne it's never the sole consideration, but it should be a primary consideration when considering which schools to close, along with all of the other political um, considerations that need to be taken into account. Yeah. And as, as to your first question, I think um, looking at not allowing um, low performing charter schools to open in the first place, I think that's really smart. My sense from, from the state is that there's a very strong push at the Department of Education, at David Hansen and his group, to really look at quality and to um, do what, what's possible to, to, to make that happen. Um, I would say the focus uh, at the state right now, both in the legislature and at, at ODE, on sponsor quality is actually very, very helpful and a step in the right direction. Um, you know, in terms of you know, really putting pressure, measuring sponsors and how well they do, how well their schools do, and really putting an increased focus on that. And I would actually tie that directly into this study. I'm wondering, okay, and maybe this is already in the works, um, but looking at, so how do sponsors handle school closure? What role do sponsors have? Can they help make sure the kids in those schools get to a better school? Can we incentivize that um, in, in the performance contracts? Maybe that's already in there. Um, but I think that, uh, just to tie what's happening, the the promising things that are happening at the state level around charter school quality, particularly with the sponsor piece, I think um, this really can tie together and there are ways to make sure that we do raise the quality of, of the charter sector and I think there's also an impact on the district sector when you start doing that. Um, so I, I really think there's a lot of connections here that we, that we should be thinking about in terms of policy and how we strengthen the system. All right. Um, again? Yeah, given the relatively mixed findings on uh, school reform, where they bring in new administrations and teachers and all that kind of thing, and the findings of this study, does it suggest that as a fundamental explanation for what's going on, the disruption of social patterns, the social environments of schools, that that, that is holding schools down or the destruction of those bad social patterns by splitting the people and sending them all over the place is one of the remedies. 
Um, that's a really that's an interesting theory, um, and we we were not able to test that directly, and I've, I'm not aware of actually any any study that tests that directly. But it, it it's it's a theory that's consistent with the body of evidence surrounding um, school turnaround and and now school closure in this context. Um, and it's it's really interesting to think about how you might go about trying to measure that that mechanism that might be at work. Um, I don't think you can I, I'm, you can't say anything definitive about that specific mechanism with what we've done. But I think that's a natural avenue for future research in this area, though. I can't help but think about some of the high profile no excuses charter schools, like say the KIPP model, where when a student enters there, it is a completely different culture, most likely from any other educational experience they've ever had. And when you look at the, the effects um, you know, that, that those schools have had in terms of when they've been studied, it, it's pretty substantial. So, you know, unless you believe it's the build, the physical building itself, <laughs> um, it may also suggest that the physical change, the changes being made with staffing and teachers are, are uh, as you suggest, potentially not enough. So that's, that's an area for future study. We'll look for funders for that report. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, any other questions? Mark? Uh, are you familiar Chicago. with the study, Devin? Or, or, or the Chicago or, work? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Chicago the Chicago work is 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 not the effects are not as positive as what we find here. It's it's largely largely negligible that there's really no difference. Um, there's no effect of school closure on student achievement um, in Chicago, um, and it it might be they didn't look as as um, clearly at school quality, but that might be. Um, a potential explanation for the two differences of a, the difference between our study and what they what has been found in Chicago. Yeah, go ahead. My understanding also those are the studies that were able to look at achievement. And correct me if I'm wrong, because their recent report I I haven't taken a look. Is yeah. So, are you referring to the previous reports that that we cited in our study yeah. where they looked at achievement? It sounds like the new reports they just. It, based on the, the recent closures, they just looked at where the students went, uh, but they weren't able to estimate effects like we did. Is that your understanding? Yeah, I think that's accurate. What they've, what they've shown is they haven't had time since the, schools, the closures were last school year. What they've shown, though, is they analyzed where the students ended up. And they did end up going, in many time, cases, to higher performing schools. Which, so maybe two or three years from now, they might want to you know, hire some researchers to go in and study and see if they get similar results. Because this kind of test, if it plays out in, in Chicago as it did in Ohio, then you may very well see a similar impact in Chicago. Um, the mayor's got four more years, though, so he's OK, I guess. He won. Uh, Matt? I mean, I, I guess it would depend on the district and the contract agreements that they have in place. But, um, you know, by and large, we have a lot of really effective, high quality teachers, and we have some that aren't. And a lot, the teachers who aren't, who have seniority, can get placed before younger teachers who might be more effective. And we see that happen. We see that happen. We see it happen in Columbus. I, I mean, I'm, I can't speak to any other district, but our contracts in Columbus, negotiated between the board and the union, allow for that to happen. So in Columbus, the teachers are forced placed into schools. Forced place is not the phrase I would use to describe it. It's um, what's the phrase I would use? Article 211, I think, is what we call it in Columbus. <laughs> Maybe not as harsh sounding, I suppose. But yes, they, if a spot is open and you have seniority, uh, you can go into that spot. And I haven't looked at this issue precisely in Cleveland, but one of the things that Cleveland Plan has done is change that equation a bit. I mean, seniority is not 
um, in Cleveland is not used at the, to the same level as it is maybe in other places. So that's starting to change in Cleveland. I know they've really been looking at how they can um, keep pushing on that. All right. Let me ask one final question, and then we'll call it a, call it a morning. Um, and it kind of came up, and many of you mentioned this, so whoever wants to, feel free to jump in. Um, closing schools, this report says, you might have a different impact than, than what was originally anticipated and kind of a little bit against conventional wisdom. But the challenge is really, uh, if you really want it to pay off, is having high quality schools. You mentioned the barriers or how difficult it is. And I think each of you have had probably this, this, this challenge in front of you in both the district and charter side. Sort of what are your thoughts about creating schools? Is it more difficult in one side or the other? Or sort of what, what, what's that plan look like? Because at the end of the day, we can't close our way to success if we don't open new schools that are, that are high performing or that have the potential to be high performing. So uh, any final thoughts to send us off? Uh, well, I, I think I think what's key. I mean, we see we have a couple of high-performing charter schools and a couple of high-performing district schools in Dayton. We could use more. Uh, the the key is I think just you know committed uh, building culture and committed teachers in that effort. And for us in Dayton, just with the sheer number of schools, I think we're obviously lacking some focus and uh, to put focus around high-quality seats and put focus around defining quality in our community uh, is going to be, I think, really key for us as we try to um, move the needle on these, on these efforts and make sure that our, our kids uh, come out ready to, ready to, to earn a decent wage. Uh, I think that that's, that's where the focus is. So, you know, you're right, you can't close your way out of it. It's a key ingredient as well as teacher quality, as well as, you know, having the partnerships in the community uh, for uh, adult engagement. I mean, there's lots of pieces I think that are really key to this, but uh, the attitude, and it's so easy for us uh, uh, in any kind of public uh, answer to say this is the one answer. There is never one answer for a public problem, and so we have to use a lot of different pieces to make sure that we get to the, the end goal, which is making sure that we have, you know, high quality schools for our kids to go to in urban centers. And it, you know, the Cleveland plan in Cleveland, has, it takes a very, it's a multifaceted approach, right? But it includes everything from pre-K to college and career. Right. So it really, starting at the very earliest stages and how do you impact that? And we have a partnership with, uh, with pre for cle which is really look, you know, creating a higher quality pre preschools and creating those connections with the schools to, to drive it from there. I will also add that we actually are hosting a, a talk today from a group that was uh, hired in Cleveland to do an analysis of, of um, where supply and demand essentially, where whether neighborhoods where there's the biggest demand, there's the most children who don't have access to quality seats in their neighborhood, and one of their approaches is like really taking, you know, targeted depending on what you're looking at, they're looking at they they've actually recommend looking at 11 particular neighborhoods where if, if there's 29,000 kids, the biggest concentration of kids in Cleveland who don't have access to quality seats in their neighborhoods, and like how do you target? Go, rather than targeting the whole city, how do you target some neighborhoods? And then how do you target some one neighborhood might have on the east side, the, the, the top neighborhood they, they mentioned actually has a lot more kids and failing and low performing schools, whereas another neighborhood might have more mid performing or, or lower performing, not failing schools. And like, what are the different approaches for those different kinds of schools and different kinds of neighborhoods to really make sure there are quality seats there? So it's, it's a really, as, as you were saying, it's not one approach, let's close schools or let's create new schools. It's really everything working together. And I think that's what is helpful. But what's encouraging to me about something like the Cleveland Plan where you do have this really broad approach, you're trying to, it's a lot to do. I mean, you can't, it's, it's hard to tackle every single issue, but in a sense you have to really think very specifically about what the challenges are in, in different schools, different neighborhoods, different needs to make sure all the needs are met. I mean, it's a good point about the different neighborhoods. I mean, Columbus, I think, is I, I'm a parent in Columbus City Schools, and um, I'm in a feeder pattern that's in high demand. There are children who are three and 400 on the wait list to get into the high school next year. We do not have a demand problem. We have a supply problem. So we need to fix that. But we need to fix it, to your point, neighborhood by neighborhood. We can't just say, well, let's just have universal preschool, because my neighborhood really doesn't need universal preschool. So we need something else, or we need something different. We, know we need support for our STEM club that gets no funding from the district, rather than that. So 
and, and to say too, the community needs to start demanding better quality from the district. We're at fault as parents every time we don't complain about a poor performing teacher or we don't complain about not having you know, access to more challenging classes. So the community, and as a member of the community and a parent, we, we need to take responsibility too and not just leave it at the door of the school board and the, the district. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. It's a great discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you.